a seat. And uh, I think Salah is here to present it. Yeah. Um, hello, everybody. I'm Salah Zayem, and I'm very happy to be here to present our work done along with Titouan Parcolet and Slim Seed. So you read the title, I won't repeat it. So let's go directly to the introduction. Uh, I will talk about self-supervised learning. Self-supervised learning has gained a lot of traction uh, recently in speech tasks. Uh, I will show one of uh, some of the models that are, are, have been designed for this. You can see now on your screens one figure from the uh, WAF2VEC uh, 2.0 model uh, paper, which, uh, which learning process uh, consists in uh, contrastive predictive coding. And um, it actually relies on uh, learning to select the next coming chunks of audio among a, a set of uh, candidates. The second model I'm showing here is the COLA model uh, outline, which relies on the contrastive learning approach and which has been uh, applied quite successfully to a range of uh, as, uh, tasks from speech tasks to music and general audio ones. Uh, the final model I will be presenting is the PACE model. Uh, the PACE mo uh, in the PACE model, uh, speech embeddings are learned through uh, solving a set of pretext tasks called uh, workers here. You can see they're here. And those uh, pretext tasks consist in uh, uh, predicting, uh, for the majority of them at least, consist in predicting a uh, set of speech features, like signal features, like prosody-related ones or spectrogram-related ones. And those uh, speech features are then used as pretext labels to be predicted. And we will be calling them from now on pseudo-labels. So, the three models I'm presenting here have shown pretty successful on the tasks they were applied to. Uh, but what we may be missing here is uh, a beforehand intelligence, a beforehand understanding of uh, why were they good for the downstream task they were aiming. And this work is an attempt to understand the underlying mechanisms that make a pretext task a good thing for a final downstream one, that make a pretext task worth the self-subversion ever effort and improves the final downstream performance. And as a first work, it has a limited scope. Actually, we will limit our scope to the third type of, of pretext task, so the one in the PACE model, which consists of the pretext task that can be framed as the prediction of, as I say, the pretext label or a pseudo label. So we'll be restricting for ourselves for this work to this kind of pretext task. So let's go on uh, quickly to uh, to to see uh, to 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 to, uh, to uh, show how we roll in self-supervised learning. So in self-supervised learning, we learn speech embeddings through learning to solve pretext tasks. You can see the the green boxes out there in the diagram. Then those speech embeddings are in the second phase fed to a downstream training model in order to be fine-tuned to perform a final uh, downstream task, a classic one like ASR or speaker recognition. But the main problem here, as I said, is that the the workers there are have been mainly uh, selected, have been purely selected empirically, and actually every testing involves two training phases, so the first one and the second one, as you can see, the, see it in the screen. And um, uh, generally, the first one is held on huge unlabeled data, thus leading to very heavy computations. So, for instance, you can bear in mind that a wave to vec 2 large model training requires like 128 GPUs for five days. So what we try to do here is trying to find a way to select those pretext tasks without the whole empirical pipeline. So the question would be, can we find a function that would score the usefulness of a given pretext task towards solving a downstream one? So to answer this question, we will start by presenting our utility estimator, whose main idea is pretty simple. It's based on conditional independence. So the more the speech samples are independent of the pretext task labels, uh, given the downstream labels, the more this pretext task should be good for the final downstream performance. So let's understand this better with an example here. Uh, let, uh, let us work on speaker recognition. So X are the speech samples. Y are the speaker IDs in speaker recognition, so the downstream label. And Z is a pitch-related feature, for instance, we're using its prediction as a pretext task. We know we can infer Z and Y directly from X, but what we want to estimate here, what we want, what we seek to estimate is how much we can directly infer Z from Y without the need of X, is how strong the dashed arrow that is represented here is. And if the dashed arrow is strong, then Z should be a good downstream label, uh, uh, good uh, pretext tasks to uh, find the speaker IDs for speaker recognition. So, 
the problem with conditional independence come very fast. The problems come very fast. It's non-trivial to compute. Actually, there's a lot of research still going on to do that. And it's even harder with speech data because speech data, if we're talking about spectrograms, we're talking about multi-dimensional ones and they are from uh, of varying length. So the first contribution of our work actually is a simple method to estimate a conditional independence, esti to, 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 to compute a conditional independence estimate with uh, speech data. So. Let's go. So um, we're going to have three steps in the presentation. The first one is how to compute the, uh, the conditional independence estimate and then how to test it while performing the true phases, so the, the self-supervised one and the downstream one. And as you can see, the, 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 the conditional independence estimate is computed using the downstream data, as you can see it with the, with the, with the, the green arrow here. So let's start with the first step. How do we estimate conditional independence here? So since speech data are hard to deal with, what we thought was a good idea was to use kernel-based independence testing. So for the moment, follow me and forget about why for the moment, we'll only find a way to test the independence, not the conditional one, between X and Z. And to do that, we will use kernels. Uh, we will use the Hilbert-Schmidt independence criterion, which is a kernel-based independence criterion that has shown successful on textual data. So we thought maybe it would be successful as well for other sequential data like speech. And with HSIC, we only need two kernel matrices, two similarity matrices, where every cell in the K1, the speech samples one, is actually a similarity value between two speech samples. And on the L1, this pseudo-label one, it's just the same, but for pseudo-labels, basically. We have two kernels, K and L. I won't, I won't get into the details of those two kernels because I don't have time to, but you can find it in the paper. L is basically an RBF on the mean value, so it's an easy one. K is a little bit more complicated. It's actually inspired from unsupervised word discovery research, and uh, it uses one technique called Gaussian downsampling. You, you will find more details about that in the paper. So if we have K and L, we can compute the independence test between X and Z, here called HSIC, using H is just a constant matrix, don't bother about it, and we have this value that is positive since it's, a, it's the Hilbert-Schmidt norm of the cross covariance operator between X and Z. And the lower the HSIC value, the more independent X and Z are. And not for the moment because it's not in the, well, uh, let's keep it. Intuition about the HSIC value is that if points that are similar in K stay similar in L, then HSIC is going to be high. And if HSIC is high, then X and Z are not independent. So. Now we have an independence test, and as I said, we want conditional independence, so we have to get Y in the loop. How do we do it? How do we go from independence to conditional independence? We are lucky to have discrete downstream labels, Y. So it's either uh, speech ID for speaker recognition, or uh, for ASR, what we do is that, that we cut at the word level, and we use the word that is being said as the downstream class. And so we can divide our data points according to the downstream class, compute the HSIC on every subset, so the, the classic independence test, and then aggregate them in a weighted mean, weighted by the number of points in every class, the NC here. So this gives us a conditional independence between X and Z, according, given Y, and if this is low, then Z is a good pretext label for the downstream label that is represented by, uh, for the downstream task that is represented by X and Y. Another intuition break, because I want you to understand this, in our cases, X and Z are not independent. I mean, Z is automatically generated from S, from X, if we're talking about speech features like the Bayes model. So X is not independent from Z, but let's understand how they can be conditionally dependent. Let's consider speaker recognition as the downstream task, and let's consider that Y then are speaker IDs. Let's suppose it's an imaginary thing uh, because we were dealing with speech features and Z is not a function of Y. But two days ago in the same hall, somebody presented a work on actually predicting age and speaker at the same time. And if we take age, for instance, as a pretext task, age is a function of Y. You know, age is a function of the speaker ID. And this um, works for this uh, little intuition thing, for the little thought experiment. And in this case, if you take two points randomly from the subset, they are likely not to be from the same speaker, and they are then likely to have different Zs, and they are likely to have different Xs because they're not from the same speaker. So you'll have a, a very high HSIC. But if you take points, ooh, déjà. if you take points uh, from the same uh, speaker, uh, what you will have is you will have a moving K because the speaker may say different words, but the L is going to be constant. The Z value is going to be constant, and this will lead to a low HSIC. So this way we got the independence 
a conditional dependence between x and z given y, and now we're going to test it. We want this value to match the final downstream performance on the downstream task we're considering. So now we're getting to the testing procedure. After the first one, we get to the second one, which is the self-supervised pre-training, which is hold on, held on huge and label data. You have to focus on the last here. We have the pseudo label we're testing, so the Z we're testing, but we also have a reconstruction target to avoid too much information loss. And then afterwards, we have the downstream fine tuning that will lead to a final downstream test error. I won't delve into the details of the model once again, because I don't have time to. It's pretty classic things that came from the uh, speech brain um, library. And uh, w to make it the more pristine possible, we actually do not use any data augmentation so that it doesn't pollute our, 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 uh, our experiments. So what are the data sets? For pre-training, we used common voice as we think it's one of the closest ones to natural second settings, given the number of speakers and the difference in the recording conditions. And we're testing on two downstream tasks, which are ASR and speaker recognition here with Timit and Voxeleb1. So, what are our pretext tasks? As I said, it's it pretext, the pretext task consists in predicting pseudo labels, and the pseudo labels are signal related features. Here they are mainly related to prosody, and they came from the base model, actually, workers, and also from the literature in feature selection for speaker recognition. So here are finally the results. The left figure points to uh, the results for ASR, and the right one Points, points to the results for uh, speaker recognition. The red curve actually points to the CI estimates and the orange ones points to the error rates, whether it's phone error rate or equal error rate. And what we want to see is what we see on the left trigger precisely. We want the shapes of the curves to follow the same monotonic thing. We want the relationship between the two curves to be monotonic because this would say that our CI estimates precisely, accurately, uh, predicts the final downstream performance. And how do, will we do that? We will, uh, we will see how many points, uh, how many pretext tasks A and B follow this rule. If, if our CI estimates say that pretext task A is better than B, then the downstream performance on A should be better than the downstream performance on B. And we have two classic uh, monoton monotonic relationship assessors, which are Spearman correlation and Kendall toe. Spearman correlation is like a classic correlation, but it's on the ranks. And the Kendall toe is a, a function, it's not exactly the proportion, but it's a function of the proportion of pairs A and B that respect the rule that I've just stated before. And those two values, the, if they are positive, we're good. If they're close to one, we're even better. And if they are negative, we're really bad. And if they are close to minus one, we should call the paper non-utility estimator and maybe do a, something else. So actually, w w it works well. The, all the values are positive, And we even, uh, even reach high values for ASR as we reach 0 0.93 for Spearman correlation and 0 0.81 for Kendall toe. So, Another very quick experiment. When we work on the Bayes model, we're not predicting, as I just shown, as I've just shown, like uh, pseudo labels. Um, uh, how to say uh, uniquely, unique ones. We do them simultaneously, and that's what we want to do. We want to learn a bunch of separate tasks together, so that every one of them gives uh, a little bit of information that is useful for our work. So we made a small test to test the robustness of our model, actually to regroup them, and we, we've just said, okay, we'll take the best ones for ASR, the best one for for speaker recognition, and the worst ones and the worst ones and we'll see if it still works and yeah unsurprisingly it still works as you can see uh, the experiments with best are with the best pseudo labels and the experiments with worst are with the worst ones and the equal rate for the best are lower than the equal uh, equal rate and or phone error rate for the worst so the first question was can we find a function that would score the usefulness of a given pretext task and uh, th the answer is yes conditional independence I, I haven't said that but uh, conditional independence isn't didn't come from uh, anywhere, it's actually based on theoretical works, is a good thing, and we can estimate it quite, uh, quite accurately, or at least we have an estimator of conditional independence that does the work. This opens a range of possibilities in how to uh, extract, how to avoid just testing that is very, uh, uh, that needs heavy computations, and explore, explore the possibilities of self-supervised learning. And finally, uh, you may be a little bit disappointed by the final experiment, but actually there is new work on the topic uh, from our team on how to better multitask select the pretext tasks. And you can see it in the preprint we just released a few weeks ago. Thank you all for your attention. Please feel free now to ask any questions you may have. And perfectly timed, thank you. Um, do we have questions within the hall? Okay. Anything online? Don't we have one question? Mm -hmm. 
No, that was an answer. But I, I have a quick question, if I may. Uh, I have noticed that uh, during computation of the kernel, you compute multiplication of matrices that look they could be quite big, which also seems that you run the experiments on quite small corpora for speech. Is it, is it a problem to compute that multiplication of four matrices? Um, actually, the, 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 the matrices we're using uh, only, only co concern the downstream data. So if you have little downstream data, which is usually the, the best case, which is usually the, the normal case with self-supervision, you won't have any problems computing those matrices. But even if the downstream data actually is not, uh, is not small, which is the case, for instance, with Voxeleb, Voxeleb 1 or Voxeleb 1 plus 2, um, what we did actually is we, you can sample. You can just say, okay, I'm not taking all the speakers in Voxeleb. I'm only taking like 50 or 100 ones. And actually that's what I did for Voxeleb and the, the, the speakers selected are in the paper. And I've tested with uh, different speakers different groups of 50 speakers exactly, and the results are pretty, uh, do not really change, are not really, are, are pretty robust to the change of group of speakers. So in any case, uh, you can make it efficient, the computation of the HSIC test. And I haven't talked about it, but it takes like around 10 minutes on multi-CPUs, you don't even okay. need something to compute these kind of things and to know if your predicts task is going to be a little good or not. Did you, for the voxel, did you measure how many speakers you need? Like 50, 100, 1,000? I think I started with 20, and then I, 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 I went to 50, and when I, when I just took like random 50 speakers, and I saw that the difference was small, I just stopped uh, at 50. Okay. But even, uh, I mean, the, the number of speakers are 1,200, I think that starts to get yeah, a little bit uh, computationally heavy, but uh, around 100 or uh, 200, actually, it's good. Okay. Uh, I, I did more uh, bigger ones for Libre Speech. It's not in the paper, it's the new paper we tried with Libre Speech mm -hmm. as well. And yeah, it, it works well. More questions? There's one uh, over by the lead speaker. <laughs> Yeah, thank you for the talk. Uh, I was wondering, for instance, for speaker, when you compute your similarity matrix with the kernel, you use a Gaussian kernel on speaker embeddings, and uh, uh, if I understand, and uh, is, is, is that no? No, that's not exactly it, because you you compute a similarity matrix and then you compare with the similarity. Yeah, but matrix the, the, the similarity matrix is between speech samples, not between speaker embeddings. Between speech samples. Okay. But afterwards, I, I just cut it into groups of points belonging to the same speaker. But the kernel is always on speech samples, and on the other side, it's on pseudo labels. Okay, okay. And, uh, uh, and can you re explain uh, also uh, how do you uh, move from your, your criterion, like uh, your independence criterion, and then how you, you, you move in order to have a conditional uh, independence criterion? Because uh, uh, the, then you, you sum over, over what? Over, over the sample? Uh, sorry, it was, uh, just uh, I to understand better. I sum over the number of classes in the downstream label. So uh, when it's Voxeleb, as I said, I sum over the, the selected speaker. So if I select 50 speakers or something like that. And uh, within every speaker, I take all the points that belong to this speaker and I make a small matrix, not the big one, concerning this speaker. I perform the HSIC test on that small uh, matrix. And then I, I add the HSICs, the, each one of them and I weight them with the number of points in every matrix. You get it? Maybe you want me to go back to why, uh, to why it should work, but no. It seems clear. We have time for maybe one more question. Uh, if any are apparent. Well, down the front here again. Is it, uh, do you think it's hard to adapt the approach for other tasks or I don't know, uh, even other domains? I mean, is it, it seems pretty generic, right? Is that, okay. Um, it, it, it's not hard. Actually, as long as the, you, you're, uh, you have uh, a classification problem. So the downstream classes you have at the end are classes, not like regression problems. I don't know if you, if you want to do a speech enhancement, maybe there's a few th other things to do before getting there. But as long as your problem is a classification problem, and as long as um, 
as long as your your pretext tasks are just regressive ones, there, there's no problem. Actually, getting I started with ASR and changing the code code from ASR to Voxelab takes like a day of work, and uh, and so that's it. But yeah, for more complex tasks like the ones that are actually used in state of the art self supervised models, uh, that's our current work. We're we're trying to make this technique applicable to those kind of things. And uh, yeah, we're exploring a few paths, uh, mainly about data augmentation, how to make it effective on data augmentation, not maybe on the, on the pretext task selection and things like that. Okay. I think we are. Yeah, that brings us to the end of the time slot. So uh, let's thank the speaker one more time.